My name is Matt Amonti. I work for a company called Bay4. And uh, what we do at Bay4 is basically make sure that solar arrays are being built properly. Um, a lot of times solar arrays are transferring between ownership. And so just like when you buy a house, you want someone to come in and have a look and make sure that everything works properly. So that's a big part of what we do. We also do a lot of research and development. And um, strictly solar is all we do. So, um, So I wanted to find out a little bit about where you guys are from in terms of schools. So maybe if you can just kind of shout out. You must be in teams a little bit. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So maybe if somebody, you guys can just shout out what yes. school you're from. Yes. Shout out yeah. yes. South yes. Point. Yes. South Point. Rio Rico. Rio Rico. Rio Rico. Rio Rico. Shout out Ridge. Shout out Mountain. 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 Red Mountain. Red Mountain. Got a lot of mountains. Independence. Okay, awesome. So, and then let's just see like a show of hands. What? Who's doing the standard class? That's a great question. <laughs> Which teams are you guys are doing the standard class? Are you unsure at this point? Or? Yeah, we're unsure. Yeah. Okay. Are are most teams unsure? Or? Uh, we're doing maker. Doing maker. Maker. Modify. Okay. Okay. Cool. All right. So I tried to kind of simplify everything down to something that all the stuff that's congruent across all the classes. We can certainly talk a little bit more about the individual class stuff because there's definitely some different things about the maker class than the standard. So presentation overview, we're just gonna we're gonna go through all the components of a go-kart. Um, we're gonna go through the solar panels, batteries, motor, charge controller, and then we'll do some questions and answering. So what is a component? It's an element of a larger whole, a system, especially a part of a machine or a vehicle. So you can see this bike, these are all the different components. Everybody's familiar with the bike, right? So something else that I want to point out is component groups. So when you're organizing your teams and when you're... Did you have a question? No, can you go back and finish where you go? Do you want that? Yes, no. please. Oh, no, we wanted the components. Oh, this is what you want? Mm -hmm. <laughs> So when you're organizing your teams and you're getting set to, to start these projects, it's good to kind of break things up into groups, right? Um, so we can talk a little bit, and this is, this is all pretty basic, I'm just kind of giving you a good overview of leading into the, the different components. So component groups that, as far as I can tell, are chassis, wheels and hubs, brakes, steering, electrical system, drivetrain. So you could probably add in there uh, separate, which would be safety maybe, like seat belt, seat, things like that. But these are your main, these are main groups. And some of these are gonna be working together in terms of coordination, right? Because the brake team, or whoever's working on brakes, needs to know what the wheels are, right? And, the steering also can, you know, needs to be, uh, in, you know, working in unison with the chassis team and, and uh, electrical system. There's some of that that overflows into the drivetrain with the motor. So let's talk a little bit about the electrical system because the, the focus of this class is going to be mostly on the motor, the batteries, and the charge controller which are all pretty heavy, heavily seated in the electrical system. So um, some of the components, solar panels, batteries, motor, the wiring. Don't forget the wiring, because uh, nothing's going to work if you forget wiring. Uh, the overcurrent protection devices, 
And if you're going to sit in the next section, we'll talk a little bit more about that. That's basically fuses, breakers, things of that nature. Uh, the charge controller, the speed controller, and the throttle. Any questions so far? We good on all this? Pretty, pretty self-explanatory at this point. So yeah, like I said, we're going to focus on these four things for this class. And I put a lot of this componentry out on the desks. So feel free to kind of check it out as we're going through this if I'm boring you. <laughs> and like I said, the next class we're going to talk a little bit more about the watt meters and the kill switches. So if that's something that interests you, we'll talk a little bit more about that. Who knows what that is? Don't say gold, don't say silver. That's a good guess. Silicon? Close. Close. Uh, so, photovoltaics, is everybody familiar with this word? Photovoltaics? Who's, no? Okay. So photovoltaic technology is what goes into solar panels. And this is the technology of harvesting UV light, irradiance, and transferring it into electricity. This is silicon. Different than silicone. Okay? So I wanted to make this distinction with you guys because I work in the industry and there's a lot of people that like to call it silicon. But it's not silicon. Not silicon. This is silicon, right? Yeah, it has oh, okay. okay. Just a little piece. <laughs> so, what makes up a solar panel? You've got a frame, you've got some glass, you've got some solar cells, a back sheet, a junction box. <coughs> And I'll slow down a little bit so you guys can absorb this. So <clears throat> this is a nice little view of what is basically making up a solar panel. So um, although this is fairly simple, there's not a whole lot of pieces to this. The manufacturing process to, do, to put these things together is very, very um, precise. Uh, these, these solar cells right here are the silicon and it is, uh, that is what is doing the work. That's what's harvesting the, 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 the irradiance and transferring it into a, an electrical current. We'll talk a little bit more about that here in a second. So a couple different types of the silicon, or just in general, the semiconductor, are monocrystalline, polycrystalline, and thin film. Okay, and so these are the different processes of of developing the solar cell itself. So, my name is So, we don't need to worry too much about this. I just want to give you an overview um, so that you guys have a little background on the different types of, of, uh, of solar cells. Um, thin film is definitely the outlier. Um, it does not use silicon. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. Bifacial is just a different manufacturing process where uh, a solar cell is is double sided. And you might might have seen these somewhere where it's sandwiched in between two pieces of glass rather than having a back sheet, and it can harvest energy from both sides, right? So how does a solar cell work? You've got those basic parts all layered in here, right? And Solar radiation, which is what we call the light from the sun, is coming down, it's going through the glass, it's hitting the, the surface of that solar cell, and it's knocking electrons across the atoms. It's enough energy to push those electrons and create a voltage. So we've got these things called bus bars, which if you look, and I wanted to bring a solar cell, but 
I didn't get around to it, uh, but you can see little aluminum strips through there. And then there's even smaller strips in between those. Those are basically like the roads and highways for the voltage for the electrons to flow. And so those pick up that flow and they transport it all along the solar the, the panel and collect it and consolidate it into the wires that leave the panel. So what are we using for this project? Does anybody know what solar panels we have to use? Poly. Okay. Um, close. Yeah, close. Uh, they're actually SIGs. So they're, they're considered thin film. So what that means is that they don't process silicon. They use a combination of other elements, namely copper, indium, gallium, and this is a compound, diselenide, that is used to spray onto an, a, like a substrate, and it, in effect, is the same, performs the same function as silicon, but it's a, just a different process of manufacturing. But this allows us to make you know, flexible solar panels. There's a lot of solar panels out there on the market that use this technology. So the advantage is, is that there's no frame, there's no glass, and these specific ones have an adhesive back sheet they stick to anything you Yeah, you can stick them on your windows, you can put them on the roof of your car. It took them forever to get it on the car. <laughs> so are you a second year? This is my third year. Third year. Is there anybody else that's been in the program for fourth year? Awesome. You can come up here and teach this class probably better than I can. Oh. <laughs> awesome. So actually, I'll give you a little background. Last year, I was involved with the program uh, building a mentor cart. And so uh, that was something that we did as an effort to build a platform to run some experimentational type um, stuff on the carts with cooling systems and um, measuring torque and having more real-time readouts for the driver. So hopefully this year, we can kind of revamp that and, and give you guys a a cool card to look at and have some example. Um, but getting back to this, so um, it's the same same basic setup, uh, but instead of glass, you have you know this UV resistant um, flexible plastic. So these are the solar panels that we had last year. I'm pretty sure they're going to use them this year again. Uh, you get two of these panels. So that's something that's <clears throat> an important distinction to be aware of, as uh, you get two of these 100 watt panels. So uh, some of the things that I want to talk to you about these panels is, um, one, I mean, first and foremost, they're flexible. So don't, you can't plan on just kind of sticking these things wherever on the cart, right? They have to have some type of support to uh, keep them in place. It helps that they're adhesive, and I believe you should get some type of an aluminum sheet to yeah. put them on. Yeah. Um, and so that makes, that takes care of that problem for the most part. But you have um, the support on the bottom of the cart so you can make it where right. Right. Yeah, you have to still support that aluminum sheet. So, another thing, another terminology that I want to make you familiar with is MC4 connectors. So that's what's on the end. This should have wires on the end here. And what's on the end of those are called MC4 connectors. They're industry standard for making connections with solar panels. Um, so that's something that if you choose to use that connecting mode, then you'll have to look into how to connect those like that, right? And uh, that's something that you can reach out to me or any of the mentors who can probably help you out with that. Um, so the other question is series or par parallel? Oh, I was gonna ask yeah. So what does uh, MC4 stand for? Um, that's actually like brand, I believe. Oh. It's uh, it's kind of like saying a frisbee. Oh. You know? Um, but since the solar industry is fairly young, 
there's, there, there's that company has paved the path for those connectors, so the industry just calls them MC4 connectors. There's MC3s and MC2s, there's also Tyco connectors, and that's another company that makes them. Okay. Good question. Uh, so, series of parallel. Who's familiar with what, what, what I'm talking about? Most of you guys? Okay. So, what happens if we put these panels in series? If you take one out, the whole thing will stop working. Okay. That's, that's part of it, for sure. What happens to the, the electricity that's going on? Specifically, like voltage and current. What are we doing when we add something in series? It's okay if you don't know. We're going to go through this, but I just want to see where we're at with, with add voltage. That. Add voltage. Voltage adds in series. Yep. And what happens to the current? Nothing. Well, I mean, unlike in, unlike in a parallel, like a parallel, that I know that the current is like equally distributed among each uh, lane. On series, it's all flowing through one. Sure. Continuous. So what happens when it's in parallel is that the current adds. So it's pretty easy to remember. Voltage adds. And you can definitely write this down. Series voltage adds and current stays the same. So if you have two panels and they are 32 volts and 3.2 amps, and that's the specification of one of the panels. If you put those in series. What's your voltage going to be? Anyone want to take a crack at it? In series, 64. what's your voltage going to be? 64. 64. What's your current? Wouldn't it be the same? Yep. So your current stays the same. So now if you put those same two panels in parallel, now you're going to get the opposite effect. right? You're going to get current adding together to get 6.4 amps, and voltage is going to stay the same. So that's a big part of solar design is coming up with your string sizing. So when you string modules together, you're creating a series of those modules. Which that in effect is going to be what voltage you get to. And then as you put those strings together, that's going to give you what current is the system is operating at. So just a little precursor because you'll be dealing with this in some capacity. There's going to be some of your team members that are talking about this more in depth. But it's a good thing to kind of understand on a, on a basic level. Yeah. Can I take a picture of the Absolutely. So in, you can find these spec sheets on their, on their website. Um, that way, if you want to do some quick calculations or just look at what the specs are, and we can go through these specs a little bit also. Um, we're going to probably, I think in this presentation, we're going to talk a little bit about IV curves. Um, and that would probably be a better spot to understand what open circuit and short circuit voltage and current are. I don't want to get too involved in that because I want to keep you guys focused on what the components are and what we're going to use them for. So let's talk a little bit about batteries. Um, batteries do a very basic function, they store energy, right? So what is the difference between power and energy? Can anyone take a crack at that? Power is energy over time. It is. There's a lot of people in my office that would struggle with that question. <laughs> so that's good that you got a handle on it. So energy is the amount of power used over a given time period. So in your house, you've got 60 watt light bulbs, let's say. Is that a power or an energy? That's a power is power. energy used over time. Power. Power is a lot. It's a power, right? So it's a 60 watt light bulb, it can use 60 watts of power. Now, if you run that light bulb for an hour, that's an energy. That's how much energy did you use, right? And it would be 
60 watt hours, right? Right. So energy, a couple of just, you know, examples of the units. You can have calories, right? You can have kilowatt hours, which is what you would have on an electrical bill. Um, British thermal units and amp hours. And so amp hours are gonna be what you see when it comes to batteries. That's what the unit of energy that they use for batteries. Power, you've got horsepower, newton meters per second. If you go into mechanical engineering like I did, uh, you'll see a lot of newton meters per second. And watts. How many watts, anybody know? How many watts to make one horsepower? <laughs> 14. Any other guesses? Ready for, ready for the answer? <laughs> Did they talk about it in orientation? No, they talk about it in computer science. Oh, cool. Wait, it's like, our, our, our still have a lot of uh, engineering programs. Yeah. And I do So you should know this. <laughs> it's okay. It's, it's just a figure. It was just a fun question. I was curious to see. Yeah. I mean, every, you know, uh, with Tesla coming out with all their electric cars, it's something that I found interesting because it's a lot of watts to make one of those cars. All right, so it's 746 watts. So if you think about a Tesla vehicle, it has to have, what, maybe 200 horsepower to be a pretty quick car. So you take 200 and multiply it by that. It's a lot of power that it has to be able to produce, right? Okay, All right, so what do we get? We get those right there. They are a 4.5 amp hour lead acid battery. Um, they run at a constant voltage until, so how batteries work is that they want to put out six volts all the time if they're fully charged. As that charge, as the capacity of that battery goes down, so does the voltage. But it can only go down so much before the battery is useless. It will never go down to zero and still be uh, able to operate. So that's why we talk about amp hours instead of watt hours. So I don't know if you guys, I mean, we can pass this stuff around or you can look at it afterwards. It's pretty simple. Um, these connectors on the ends, they are set up to accept what's called a spade connector. So when you go to link these up into series or parallel, you're going to want to use the correct connectors to slide onto these guys. Um, and then I guess I'm going to jump into torque versus speed a little bit. Uh, so this is dealing a little bit more with the motor. Um, So what you see here is a torque versus speed graph, right? And so this, this here is your, your line. And as you can see, it's a linear relationship. So if you take that motor and you hold on to the end as hard as you can, and you supply it with, with power, it's not moving anywhere, right? So, and you are applying a maximum amount of torque with your hand, to stop it from turning, right? As you loosen your grip, that rotational speed of that motor is going to increase. And that relationship is linear, meaning that it is a, a direct ratio. It doesn't have exponents or any kind of fancy quadratics or anything like that. So what that means is that angular velocity is proportional to torque and is proportional to current. So how you increase the speed of these motors is by fluctuating the current that is being supplied to that motor. So where that comes into play with your design a little bit more on the mechanical side 
is that it affects your gearing, your wheel size, and your top speed. So one thing that you want to make sure of is that you have enough torque to move this cart, right? Because you could have a really high top speed, but if you can't get moving, you're not going to go anywhere. So where you need that torque is at that, it's called the stall of the motor. So the stall of the motor is the cart is sitting on the ground and it has no uh, acceleration or velocity. It's just sitting. So where you need that torque the most is at that stall. Once you get moving, then as that motor's RPMs increase, the amount of torque that's necessary goes down. That's why you can have gear shifting in the cart. So you can get it started mm -hmm. and switch over to that gear. Right, and so that's where this comes into play. If this were a larger gear, it takes much more torque at the center of this to lift this, to lift this one kilogram, right? This is just a real basic understanding of, of what's going on there. You have to keep that stuff in mind when you're, when you're starting to think about tires. And that's something that everybody thinks about the gears, but they don't think about the tires. That's still connected and still part of the drivetrain. It's still what dictates how much torque is being applied and, and to get the car moving. So, um, so all things to consider. So what do we get? We get that motor right there. And if you haven't seen one, they're pretty nice. They're a good motor. Uh, they have some good attachment points, pretty heavy duty. Uh, the one thing about that motor that's important for design purposes, other than the, the specifications, is that it comes with this gear that's at the end. And that gear is not a bike gear. It's a number 25 tooth, or it's a number 25 11 tooth gear. So it won't fit a bike chain. So that's something that um, you wanna keep in mind when you're starting to design, because a lot of people like to go to bike gears and then realize that the chain doesn't fit. Right, so you may have to change this out, and if you're going to do that, you definitely want to make sure that you get that wrapped up before you commit to using bike gears. Because if you can't figure that out, or if you get run into too many snags and have to go back to this, then your drivetrain is completely worthless. Unless you, you know, go through the process of putting another axle in there and transferring that to a different gear, and then it becomes a little bit of a snowball. So the rated torque output is 3.2 newton meters. So what we did on our cart was we calculated uh, how much torque it was going to take to move that mass across the ground. And that was how we kind of decided on some of our gearing sizes. Um, so some of these parameters that are given here are good knowns. If you're sitting down to look at an equation or trying to do some calculations, there's a lot of information on the spec sheet about this motor. Um, and you, with any electrical system like this, you always want to keep in consideration all the different components because it's like a chain, right? So if one has a limitation of 24 volts and the other has a limitation of 12 volts, it's a 12 volt system. There's no way of getting around it. So everything has to work together. So if you decide to link those solar panels up, you need to know what that's going to do to the entire system. Same thing with the batteries. So try to look at it as a system um, before committing to any one section of that as well. So this is a big part of how the solar panels are able to charge the batteries and run the cart. So it's basically a charger, just like you would plug into the wall to charge your phone. It performs the function of managing the amount of power that is sent to the batteries, right? The difference is that with solar panels, you, they're completely reliant on the amount of irradiance that's being sent to them from the sun, right? So if it's a really sunny day and as the sun gets higher up in the sky and it's pointed directly at that solar panel, it's going to be generating a lot more amperage through those solar panels. 
And so what that solar charge controller has to do is it has to manage that power that's coming from those solar panels and send it to the battery in a way that doesn't blow those things up. So we want to talk a little bit about max power point tracking. And what that is, uh, in order to understand that, you have to understand what an IV curve is. So that's what we're going to talk about right here. Does, any, does anybody need that last slide? So this is an IV curve. You've got current I on the, on the vertical axis and the volts on the X axis. And so what this is is a solar panel has a certain range of voltage and current that it can produce. The maximum amount of volts is going to be the open circuit voltage, which is if the circuit is completely open, it's at the maximum amount of voltage. And that on this is like 22 or something. Now, same thing over here, the short circuit current is if that circuit is closed and there's no load, it's up in you know the three amps. I think on these it is about three amps. I'm not sure where I got this actually, but all solar panels are in a certain range. So this is fairly indicative of what, what the curve would look like for these panels. So what's important to understand is as that panel is producing power, it doesn't really pick what voltage and what current it leaves that up to the radiance and the way that the panel is designed. As that goes to the charge controller, the charge controller will pick how much of a load it wants to put on that, on that solar panel. And so by varying that, it can find the maximum amount of power that it can harvest from the solar panel. So basically, if you think about who knows Ohm's law? Ohm's law, V equals IR, right? Okay, so that can be derived into several other uh, very simple equations. And one of those that's very important is P equals IV. And so that's power equals current times voltage. And so what you're seeing here is exactly that. It is current and voltage. So if you think about this as a square, Right, the area of a square or a rectangle rather is what? Length times width, right? Yeah. So here you've got P equals IV. Let me, let me write it out this way. Okay, so in this case, for a rectangle, you would have. width, right? And so power is actually the area, uh, the area underneath this curve. And so as that charge controller is receiving the current and voltage from the solar panel, it is trying to find that point on this curve that maximizes the area underneath this, this uh, rectangle. And so that's how you maximize the power that you're, that you're getting from that panel. So that's one of the primary functions of that solar controller and what separates it from something like your charger that you plug into the wall. Now, all chargers, all battery chargers also perform another set of, of uh, operations. I don't know, let me just see. So it also performs uh, another operation which is to charge in different stages. And so depending upon what the voltage is of that battery and the, the uh, current that's being drawn, it will adjust how it's charging that battery. So there's these three stages, bulk, constant, and float. If your batteries are 100% full, it's floating, right? It's just kind of floating that voltage, keeping it all very, it's a full, it's a full pool, essentially. So, Bulk charging would be, once it gets below a certain threshold, it dumps as much voltage and current into that battery as it can. 
the constant state is like the middle ground some place in there. <laughs> These are the specifications on your Tracer 1210 amp, which is this guy, right? So these are your specifications. These give you your different voltages. Th those are gonna be mildly useful, but just understanding that that's the operation of this thing is important. Um, while you're testing, if something's going wrong, if the cart is behaving strange, where it's going really slow, run some checks on what your voltage is of your batteries. See what the charge controller needs to do. Uh, let's go back up here. So, charge controller is right between these guys, right? So it gets fed from the solar panels and goes to the batteries. Um, and we're not going to get into necessarily too much of the specifics in this class of, of how that gets wired up. Uh, that's actually next class. What does the yellow box say? It's absurd. Charge, charge control. Charge okay. control. Okay, thank you. So one thing that I want to stress to you guys is that a lot of this stuff is it's going to be overwhelming a little bit at first. Um, the most important thing to take into consideration, in my opinion, is don't wait to start hooking this stuff up. I mean, don't just go hook it all up and hope that it works, but don't wait until the cart is built or the cart is ready. Set this stuff up on a bench. You don't need any mechanical, you know, you can, you can bolt that motor into a little plate or something or a piece of wood and you can set up a test bench so that you can run this stuff because you don't want to wait until the cart is ready because the cart's not going to be ready until like the week before the race. I'll, I'll let you in on that for sure. So, so do some testing, hook this stuff up, do your research, run some wires. We can talk a little bit more about that in the next class. How many of you guys are in the next class? It's uh, watt meters and kill speeds. You guys are? Okay, so not that many people. If I, had, if I had a little more time, I would run through some of that, but you'll have people from your team that can kind of put those pieces together a little bit. Is there any questions that you guys have for me on components? We can talk about any of the components. We don't have to necessarily focus in on the stuff we can talk about wheels or whatever. Hey guys. Hey guys. I can't hear. The throttle. So the throttle is actually right behind you. If you want to take a look at it. So that works in unison with the speed controller, which is right there. And what that does is it sends a signal, electronic signal, to that speed controller, and that speed controller can can interpret the signal and, and basically adjust the amount of amperage that's going to the battery. Right, I'm sorry, that's going to the motor. So it's a twist throttle. You can use different things, uh, and I actually had to take apart ours because we fried it. That's a It's like this crap. No, no, that one's good to go. Oh, okay. Uh, I mean, it should be. But, okay. yeah. Um, so, you know, it's, you definitely want to be careful um, hooking this stuff up. It's very easy. There actually is a micro, like a very small microchip in there that uh, it's like gets into electronics a little bit too deep. But it basically, it's like a proximity. Uh, sensor, so it has a little magnet, and then the further away from that sensor it gets, the more voltage it allows through those wires, and that's how it kind of sends the, the signal of where you are with that throttle. But we fried it, so we had to go get a new one. Yep, I figure out where it's the best spot for it, so for your, the driver can see it. We did it like, you know, a bicycle handle, we just made it like that, up to it, and put it right there. Mm -hmm. That's yeah, that's how our car was too. We used like some motorcycle handles and just put it on there. And, yeah. yeah. 
Any questions? I have a really general question, but are you going to have access to these slides? Like, um, yeah, I can make yeah. them accessible. Um, I don't know how I'm going to do that <laughs> with all of you guys. What did you make it on? What's that? Did you make it on like a Google Doc or Word? It's just PowerPoint. Oh, power, oh, yeah. PowerPoint. I mean, you could probably send it through our emails because you just got them all. For but did you really I, want to take like... I, well, the sign up sheets all have like the emails okay. for the design oh, students and teachers. Oh, for the class? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So .com. That's fine. I can do that. Um, how do you guys usually share documents? Because it's different in the business world. We're using, I, I think, we're using like Dropbox or Box.com. Or... No. We, we no. Do you use yeah. Dropbox? Yeah. All right. Let's set something up. That way you guys can have access to it. Um, if you want, yeah. Well, that's nice. This is exactly contained to one itself, but um, is there like a, a game where like everyone comes and like practice? Is there like a practice run or is just like there a is a practice? Yeah, yeah, there's a test day. I think it's a test called test day. Uh, practice day. It's like a practice day. You see how your card's doing. Okay. And they score on basically what you need to do. It's like a test to see what your card needs to be fixed. Right. Yeah, I, I think it is called test day. Um, and so you actually do get points for showing up to that and passing the, the being able to put your cart on the track, I believe. They also use test to measure where your cards are going on race day. Right. Yeah, you get like a qualifying time or something. Like, is, is the time like the rules and regulations? Yep. Yeah, and that main packet, it's got like 60 pages. A lot of that information is in there. So you mentioned Tesla. Um, what would be the big thing using an AC motor for Tesla? Like, why did they use AC? Because there's a lot of efficiency with that. Why doesn't Tesla use an AC motor? No, why does it? Because it uses DC. Because it uses AC, why doesn't it use like a DC bus? What would be the pros and cons? Why doesn't it use an AC? Oh, okay. Because it does use an AC. Right. Um, it might have something to do with the fact that the source of power is AC. Okay. Um, a bit, like, from from the start. I, I'm not actually sure. That, that's something that's definitely Tesla's secret formula. They've got a lot of that stuff that's pretty locked down. But that's a good question, and it probably is a pretty simple answer to that that I don't know. Yeah? You can talk with her afterwards. <laughs> uh, we've got like minutes left uh, if you guys want I can show you some photos of the process that, it, that we did for making our cart last year. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> so all starts on paper, right? Shouldn't. Oh, yeah. Get that, guys. 
So this was like the, the side view. This was the original idea. We decided to use bike parts. This was maker class, right? Mm -hmm. So we decided to use bike parts. We felt that they were l the lightest and most available. So this was kind of some, some uh, hypothesizing, some brainstorming on how to make handlebars turn two wheels. This is this doesn't work. <laughs> do, I mean, it kind of does, but um, something that you might run into with the maker class is something called the Ackerman principle, and that has to do with how uh, wheels need to turn at different angles. So in your car, when you go around a turn, the wheels actually don't stay parallel. The inside tire actually turns a little bit more than the outside. Yeah, that's nice. A design like this, that doesn't happen. I had to face that issue with uh, other members who were four years, and I was like, two years we did the maker card, and it was like, we had to fix it, and it was like, oh, God. So that's kind of what this was all about. So this is actually a good picture because this shows some of the, like a really simple way to mock something up. Um, there's a lot to be said for getting creative and kind of making something. This is just pegboard and cardboard with some bolts so that I could kind of watch how these things turn. And what that turned into, uh, this is some other stuff, motor mounting. But what that turned into <laughs> is uh, that steering system, and then eventually this. And what I used this for was, this was just a little bit more of a complex, like more accurate way to run the steering system. And we collected data off of the tire angles, and we were able to create a spreadsheet and kind of do some graphing and look at what's the best angles for all the, the steer arms and things like that. So it's kind of fun setting stuff up like this because you can focus a little bit more on the actual um, theory and less on building the car. And that's an important part of that design process because if you dive right into welding stuff or bolting things onto a, to an axle or to a steering system and then it's not how you want it, it's a lot more difficult at that point to kind of backtrack and reassess how you want to do things. So building these like types of jig mock-up type setups is very useful. So this is kind of the cart st starting to come together, starting to put some pieces together, setting things into place, deciding on how wide, how long things need to be, fabricating some parts. My dog. Uh, let's see. So this was one of the tie rods that I made for the steering system. And it uses, it's basically a ball joint, a heim joint. Um, and that allows that steering to have a lot of flexibility in terms of binding and it doesn't, you know, it, it allows that steering to be at different angles and gives you a little bit of flexibility with, with where you're mounting the, the different pieces of the steering system. This is that plate that the modules can sit on. I'm building the frame for that. Getting everything into place, starting to come together there. When I was looking at your um, what's the thing? A motor that you were working with and how you put it in place, we had like the same basic idea, but we yeah. made it in a metal sheet box, so we had to cut some parts off and smooth it down. And the funny part, we had it dismantled in a little bit to rotate it around. Yeah, so we had to put the wiring cut a little in there and make it a system of gear ratio, the gear ratio on the at, at the back of it when it was really open, so we can move it around. And it was like a little basically hard because we had to build it down too. So, 
once again, you know, just mocking things up, setting things into place, deciding on where things need to be in order for there to be the right clearances for steering and where your feet need to go and all that stuff. Um, so these are the steer arms that, that I made. And those get, got welded onto the forks of the, of the front forks. You see the process of kind of building those. Those are the finished product. This is tapping the aluminum, building the steering system. How long did that take you to make the whole cart? We built the whole cart in two months. Wow. Yeah, it was really rushed. We, we, we really rushed through it. And, and that's, you know, that's really like what it comes down to is, is getting started, getting some ideas on paper. Because the more, more time that you spend up front, um, you know, and the quicker that you can get to a section where you can actually start putting some things together, because testing and troubleshooting are going to occupy a third of your time. So even if you get the cart done within a month, you still need that whole month to just troubleshoot and test. We had our cart finished last year, but then like halfway through, it cut off like halfway through we started. All right. Well, thanks for listening. You guys have my email and my contact information. If you don't, you will. If you have questions, reach out.